So let, let, me just give you, let me just give you one example of, of how um, it, it has worked for us. For, and, and I know that one of the things that you all have talked about is collective bargaining. And, and here's another thing. If, if people are put in positions not based on their talent and the quality of their work, but on seniority, then th there's no way you're improving. You're not going to get better that way, right? So shame on those places that are still allowing that to happen. So we, um, for, w w with the uh, support of the school committee and, and in collaboration with the teachers union, we make sure that we have people in leadership positions based on talent, not on seniority. So here's just one quick example. And Tony can talk about content leaders and that sort of thing. Um, we uh, established this initiative called Thinking Maps, right? And, and, and a, lot of our, a lot of our work starts as a pilot. So we have um, some, it was actually a parent who actually brought it to my attention when I was the assistant superintendent. She said, Bob, you got to like consider implementing this in your school. It's thinking maps are these, they're eight maps. They're actually, they're, they're, you know, you're all familiar with graphic organizers, but, but thinking maps, there are only eight. And there is a thinking map for, um, there is a map that accommodates a number of, of tasks. So there may be a, a, a word that um, triggers um, a student's, a task that a student's supposed to complete. So for example, if, it's, if a student is asked to, asked to summarize, then one of these maps is used to summarize. Uh, there is a map for comparing and contrasting. But anyway, there are a number of vocabulary words that trigger the use of a map. There are only eight. And here's the difference between a thinking map and graphic organizers. There are thousands of graphic organizers. Thousands and thousands and thousands of graphic organizers. And usually the teacher gives it to the student and says, hey, fill this out. I'm, I'm going to get to my point here in a second, right? So, so the student doesn't have to think about the graphic organizer. They just have to think about completing the task, right? The, here's the difference. If a student is given a task, they, because they, are, they have been trained to do this, they know immediately which map they need to use for that specific task. And, and the beauty of that is, this is something that they can use forever. So what we did was, we had two grades at community school volunteer to implement these thinking maps. So we trained some teachers, and then we, um, and, and the thinking was, well, let's try this, implement this over the course of the year. And then what happened was, and it was grades three and five. And then what happened was, the second grade teacher said, hey, we want to do that too. And the fourth grade teacher said, we want to do that too. So before the year was up, we had an entire school trained. Then, because we had an entire school trained, uh, we, other schools said, hey, we want to do that too. So what we did was we trained some um, teachers in the building and we, we identified, I think, two, two, teachers, two teachers per building because all the other buildings wanted to jump on this. We identified two people in every building to be trained on thinking maps and they led the training of their colleagues. That's just one example. Does that give you some idea? <laughs> Though, in um, you know, how you identify those teacher leaders and whether or not they're actually compensated for their additional role and responsibility. I'm going to take it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, what we do is when we are selecting, I'll use our curriculum mapping process as an example. Let's say that we are working on a grade three ELA. Okay. What we do is, is we ask building principals to identify a grade level leader from their building who has the attributes that they feel will do a number of things. One is, is they have to commit and be actively engaged in the professional development. When we ask you to come to the district, you're coming, you're showing up with fidelity, okay? 
So the building principles really drive the selection. What we do is we quality control that when that teacher is involved in the professional development. So for example, myself and my two curriculum coordinators, we're virtually inseparable, meaning we are constantly looking at research data and planning out whatever professional development's gonna happen. So in that re regard, we will have the conversations around assessments for, for grade 3LA, what we wanna accomplish, what we wanna, uh, we pre-do all that work, okay? So at that table, a representative from each of the schools is sitting there from third grade, okay? And they engage in all of the work, and they assume the responsibility of leading that work when they get back to their buildings with their colleagues. And the way that we quality control that is, is through data. We check in with them constantly, all the time. If there are teachers that are maybe bucking at the changes that we made, because not everybody can be at the table. You're never gonna get anything accomplished if you have 23rd grade teachers in a room. You're never gonna come to consensus. So we have representation there. Uh, when we deliver the message to the buildings, it's their job to execute it, and then we ask that the building principals engage in our on-site, holding them accountable to doing that work during CPT time or professional development time. They are, the, we ask them to actively engage in being present because that presence creates accountability, and then they communicate back with us and the curriculum coordinators, and we just have that, that cycle that keeps going on and on. Have there been times where we've had to replace teachers at the table? Yes, there have been. Sometimes teachers can't handle the, the, may not want the responsibility after they see what's involved. Sometimes uh, other colleagues are better, um, are, are better skilled to do it, and other times building principals make the switch. So we try to leave that open. So we, we use the summer, and we pay them the contractual rate, right? So, um, and it requires some planning because there is a finite amount of money to get that done. So to specifically answer your question, like, a lot of times we'll ask for volunteers, and it really is heartwarming to see how many teachers want to volunteer to be a part of this. And it, it really is that bottom-up thing again. And that, whole, that example I gave you of thinking mass, that really was a bottom. It actually started with a parent and who had a conversation with some teachers, and it just sort of took off from there, bottom-up. And we, just a, just a uh, quick uh, story as an aside, when we were doing our um, strategic plan, we met with high school students, we met with each of the um, middle school students, so you know, 15 to 20 students from each school participated in this process. And at both middle schools, when we asked them to complete a task, I remember it vividly, and this was several years ago, I remember like it was yesterday, they said, what map? should we use to do this work? So you know then that you're making a difference and providing um, some really um, helpful learning tools to students when they, you know, just, uh, you know, instinctively discuss with one another what map they're gonna to use to complete that particular task. Yes, Lori. Bob, I was just thinking about this. Um, we are moving in Rhode Island to, um, continuing ed units, professional development points, right? Mm -hmm. Moving back there. So in the district where I work, which is a neighbor to yours in Massachusetts, we do a lot of this work, just to answer um, Carolyn's question too, a lot with professional development points. Now a lot of those, they can get bundled and then teachers go to lane changes, but it has less of an immediate effect on a budget. And while we pay them the contractual amounts as well for summer work, Lots of our teacher leaders will take on leadership work, leadership role, development of professional development for their colleagues for additional PDPs. And we just count those up and then they can use those towards their, um, their lane changes. You know, I'm, gl I'm glad you mentioned that. And one of the things that we have done, again, with the support of the school committee, is we have early release Wednesdays. So every single Wednesday, our students go home an hour earlier and our focus this year has been on establishing professional learning communities. So a PLC, professional learning community, is very different than common planning time. So we have learned that this early release time that we have every Wednesday can be used towards these uh, continuing education um, hours that, that all of our staff are required, including, including 
um, administrators and, and the mapping sessions that Tony uh, made reference to can also be included. So we are, I mean, you know what? We, we didn't mention that. I can't begin to tell you how important that is. I mean, t talk, like we're teaching and learning every Wednesday. That is really helpful in moving this work forward. Is there another question? Yeah. More questions? Office, so they're full time. Yes, they are. are they considered teachers or administrators? They are uh, teachers. Uh, they receive a, an additional stipend on top of their step, uh, and the the reason for the additional stipend is because they, they attend achievement subcommittee meetings. They present at school committee meetings with myself, uh, and they are. It, yeah, they have extensive summer work that they do along with me. So uh, they receive their step plus a, a stipend. Right. They're, they're probably underpaid. Okay. And you have curriculum leaders within the schools too? Do you have a, yeah? So we, um, at the middle school level, uh, we have content leaders. At the high school level, we have content leaders. At the elementary level, we have the curriculum uh, mapping representatives for each grade level. Yeah. In ELA and in math. So they're not full time, they're just... Their teachers and a portion of their time. Correct. All right, Correct. and then you you mentioned a data analysis person in yes. your office. Is that a full time? Position? That is a full time position. Uh, that is a, a position that does not uh, is not funded through uh, our general fund. Uh, we use uh, CRP uh, monies um, for that uh, position, and the vision behind that was really. How I constantly ask myself this question because principals are burdened with so many things. How can we create ways to support principals' work within the with their within their respective buildings, and generate data for them so that they can be more responsive in their buildings? And how can they help me be more responsive to patterns of data across the district? So that's that was the breadth of that position. So is that a person with a teaching background? It or? is in the uh, evening, uh, for one hour. And there are a variety of agenda items depending on something that we may want to present and make them aware of, something that may, like if we're going to purchase a new curricular piece or there may be things that we want to bring to the Achievement Subcommittee before it goes to fiscal. Uh, so we try to follow a chain of command so that we inform as many people as possible of what's going on. All right, I, so, so I, you I, have three school committee members, yourself. Yeah. Correct. And? The two curriculum coordinators. Okay. My, my, um, my data coordinator. Yep. And typically, at times, are my uh, L coordinator attends. Okay. Does that trigger OMA? I'm sorry. Does that trigger OMA yes. compliance? Yes. 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 It's an open. It, they are. Yes. And and just so that you know, like there are three members of the achievement subcommittee. I would say 90 percent of the time, most of the school committee members show up to those meetings. I show up to 99.9 .9 percent unless of of those meetings unless there I have some sort of a conflict. So. They're um, really uh, interesting um, meetings focused on data and, and improving student achievement. They're, I mean, I, that is, I mean, if there's one thing that you might want to, I, I don't know if you're doing that in, in your districts, uh, that is, I think, a really helpful thing that you all can consider doing. It holds everyone accountable, keeps everyone focused, and, you know, our administrators need to be ready to present if need be, if, this, if the Achievement Subcommittee, you know, wants um, information or wants to know how things are going in a specific school, then people have to be ready. Keeps you on your, to all of us, on our toes, in a good way. Quick question, are we welcome to monitor one of yours? Of course. It's an open meeting. Of yeah, course. it's an open meeting. You, you yeah. certainly have the, they're, of course. They're, every, it's usually the second and fourth, second, The, it, the, 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 our meeting, our meetings are right. So we, we, our school committee meetings are second and fourth Thursdays. The the we have our subcommittee meetings and we have policy sub, achievement sub, and fiscal sub. We, those meetings are scheduled, um, the the Tuesday and Thursday, the the Tuesday before the um, the school committee meetings. Paul, I just I just want to say. Bob had said most of the school committee members come to achievement even though we may not be on it. We get a lot of information about the schools, what's happening in the middle schools. Mr. DeMarner and his team give us detailed presentations of what 
they need, what's happening, how the kids are moving. And from there, we generate a plan for fiscal because he'll say, I need three more interventionists for the middle schools. Or I think this year it's four. Um, and so we all understand from a school committee perspective what he's looking for. We try to budget it with Mr. Hess because it's in his fiscal department. And then when we get to the school committee meetings, we're all in the same plan here because we all showed up at these other meetings and talked about it. A couple of years ago, Mr. DeMana came in and said, I need a new curriculum in two years for K through two. That's right. And this is what it's gonna cost us. And every time we had fiscal meetings, a business manager would come in and say, yeah, yeah, we got you know, the money. And I kept on reminding him, $200,000 is being set aside for the curriculum. We're deal, you know, we knew what was coming down the road. So most of us come to achievement because that's where you learn what's really happening in your schools. So when you have these um, achievement meetings and you call in staff members like teachers, uh, part of the building instructional team or whatever you call it, um, are they paid for that time or they're just coming in? They're, they're all part of your yeah. mantra? Yes. Okay. yes. Thank you. And I, I, if I could make one, one uh, statement, I, I believe very strongly in the curriculum coordinator model. Um, the reason why I advocated for the model is because curriculum work is extensive, it is laborsome, it spans grade levels, it is extremely deep work. Interpreting standards is very complex. It's not something that you can do superficially. And you need people driving that work every day. And you need to have those conversations and have those people doing that work all the time so that you continue to have momentum. Because the second you take the foot off the pedal, uh, in education, it's hard to re-get that engine started again. So uh, that's, that's our approach, and I believe in it. You know, I, I, you know I, I wanted to mention one really important thing. And this is going to sound crazy, I think, but I believe it's the truth. Our teachers know the standards because we spend so much time working with them on the standards. Tony and his team are locked in on um, grade level standards. And all of the work that we do, uh, our, our uh, assessments are all connected in some way to what students are expected to know, to gain grade level proficiency. So here is my question to you. Are you sure that your teachers who are preparing students to um, be proficient on the common core standards, are you teaching what is being assessed? Are your teachers teaching to the standards? That's a really important question. So you should be able to walk up to teachers and say, you know, what standards are you working on? And, and if they can't answer that question, then you have some work to do. There, I, I believe that the single biggest, we've, there's a lot of reasons why we've jumped from where we were to where we are now, is because we have, we're locked in on standards and report cards are aligned to standards. We have standards-based report cards, which was, Talk about fighting a battle. People want to see B, A, C, D. They want to see those things, right? So you, you, you spend this ridiculous amount of time learning all these things, and then people want to see, because that's what we're accustomed to. They want to see the, the letter. So an average. And you could start off not knowing a whole heck of a lot, and at the end, know everything that you're supposed to know, but because it's averaged, you're hurt by that, isn't it? It's not where you start out. It's where you end up, right? It's not where you start out. That's what standards are. It's not where you start out. It's where you end up. So uh, our report, and we're doing a lot of work on report cards. They're not perfect. Talk about, like, turning the Titanic to getting people to thinking differently about getting away from a grade level and class rank and GPA and all that stuff and focusing on standards, which is what we're assessing, standards, right? So um, I think that's a really important question you need to ask. Do my teachers in my school district know the standards? Questions? 
Well, thank you, Superintendent Mitchell, Assistant Superintendent Damana.